welcome back to week two of You in Five Years. Uh, this series is appropriate because I uh, really believe, as all of us do, that this crisis that we're in right now will one day be over. And my prayer is that during this time, uh, and we all have a little bit of extra time, that during this time that you might be considering some of the things that we are discovering here in this series. Now, as we start, let me just talk to you about the direction of this series. Uh, I'm going to do it up here on the whiteboard. Uh, last week, what we did uh, was we started with what we just simply call the who. Who do you want to be? And that's really the crux of everything that we are doing. Now, this week we're going to lean a little bit deeper in, and what we're trying to do in the series is start with our core, right? And then we want to lean into higher levels of application as we go. And so this week we're going to draw the second circle, and we're going to cover this idea of what is it that I need to start? For you in five years, what is it that I need to begin? And we're going to lean into that today. And then next week, we're going to come back. Let me draw the last circle here. I was practicing this earlier, and it looked like an egg. So if it does, my, my apologies. Uh, but we're going to look at not only what we need to start, but we're going to come back next week and say, <laughs> what do I need to stop in the next five years? And, and sometimes this is exactly what we need to look at. What do we need to stop doing to be all that God wants us to be, our redemptive potential? Okay, uh, but who, and then this week, we're going to begin with the start. What do I need to start? Now, y'all realize that you were created on purpose, uh, and you weren't only created on purpose, you were created for a purpose. Up here on uh, the table here, I have uh, a carpenter's pencil. Uh, a, carpenter's a carpenter's pencil was created for a purpose, and it was created on purpose. Uh, it's flat. It's not round like a regular pencil. The reason it's flat is because when a carpenter makes his lines and his marks, he oftentimes will set it down, and he doesn't want his pencil to roll off the material that he's working on. And so they created a flat pencil. It is created for a purpose, and it has a purpose, right? Well, the same is true with us. When we are pursuing our purpose over the next five years, what we have to begin to do is we have to evaluate our goals and even our systems to make sure that we are putting these things in place so that we can be successful in the next five years. And we're going to talk about that here today. Now, our backdrop uh, that we're looking at is the story of Daniel, the person of Daniel. Now, I'm going to invite you to grab your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 5, or excuse me, Daniel chapter 6, and we're going to look at some verses there. And as you're doing that, um, I'm hoping that wherever you're sitting, if it's in your living room or in front of your computer, I'm hoping that you're in some kind of chat, whether it's with your life group or some kind of online party that, that maybe you've put together, but you're talking about this message, that you're, that you're sharing back and forth maybe what God is doing in your heart. Why? Well, I launched the theme this past week. We have to remember the building is closed, but the church is not. The building is closed, but the church is not. In fact, wherever you are, whoever you're with, maybe you're by yourself, and I want you to say this out loud, but let's all say this together about the church. The building is closed, but the church is not. One more time. The building is closed, but the church is not is not. And so we want to continue together to live in fellowship. All right. So you make certain that you're talking back and forth wherever you are. And so last week we opened up this story of Daniel. And I tell you, man, Daniel is a remarkable guy, isn't he? Uh, we learned last week that he was part of, a, of an elite group of people that was deported from Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar came in and besieged Jerusalem. He took the brightest and the best and he deported them over to the city of, uh, uh, over to Babylon uh, to serve in the king's court. And Daniel was one of those guys. Now, that's really impressive that he was one of the guys that was deported. But I'll tell you what was really impressive is that Daniel not only was part of that elite group, he ended up being part of the elite three. And he was going to be chosen by the king to oversee his affairs. And this guy was remarkable. Let's pick up the story, Daniel chapter 6, 
verses one through three, and then we're gonna make some practical applications as we walk through this chapter together. Verse one, it pleased Darius, who's now the king of Babylon, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. That's an impressive guy. Now we don't know what it was that made Daniel so incredible. But what we do know is that the people around him didn't like it. And they didn't like him. Check out verse 4. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could not find, or excuse me, they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. So they took a deep look at this guy and they could not find anything wrong in how he handled his life. And I was studying this week and I thought, man, could I stand up under that kind of scrutiny, the kind of scrutiny that Daniel was under? It's a good question to ask yourself. Could you stand up against that kind of scrutiny? Well, Daniel did stand up against it, but what we do know is that because they could find nothing wrong with him, they leveraged the one thing that they could do to bring him down. And that was they leveraged Daniel's relationship with his God. Now, I want you to check this out, verses 5 through 9. Finally, these men said, We will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do, and here it is, with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Verse 8, now, your majesty, issue a decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. And then look at verse 9. So King Darius put the decree in writing, to which all of those satraps, governors, administrators said, we got him. We got him. But what did Daniel do? Daniel stood up to the test. He didn't give in. Now, as I read that in Scripture, I think, man, what if that happened to me? Daniel didn't have a crisis of faith when that happened. I wonder if I would have a crisis of faith. I wonder if you might have a crisis of faith. Because we might ask the questions of God, God, haven't I been faithful to you? Haven't I pursued relationship with you? Haven't I prioritized you? Why is this happening to me? But Daniel doesn't ask, as far as we know, doesn't ask any of those questions. And it bodes the question of why. And I submit to you that it was because of his habits. It was because of his system that he had been following for years and years and years. And we're going to see that unfold as we go. And I believe that Daniel started a system that yielded a life that opened up his redemptive potential. Let's look at verse 10. We looked at it last week, but let's put everything together. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. And here are the six most powerful words, just as he had done before. Now here's the lesson, and we cannot miss it. Daniel prioritized his life around intimate time with his heavenly father. 
Let me just say that again. Daniel prioritized his life around intimate time with his heavenly Father. One of the concepts that I've been preaching and teaching here for 20 years here at Western Reserve is this. You are as close to God as you want to be. Nobody just stumbles into intimacy with God. Nobody just accidentally becomes full of spiritual strength, full of spiritual power, full of faith. It doesn't happen by accident. And the principle is true in our lives, isn't it? I'm as close to my wife Marcy as I want to be. I'm as close to my son Caleb and daughter Emily as I want to be. I'm as close to the team that I work with here at church as I want to be. I am as close to my best friends as I want to to be. It's a principle. Daniel made a decision to be close to his heavenly father. And it yields something else that we see in this story of Daniel. Never underestimate how our God can start something big through one small habitual act of obedience. Never underestimate How our God can start something big through one small habitual act of obedience. And what you're going to find when you begin this type of system in your life, you're going to find that there are certain habits that when you have them in place, they help propel you onto other helpful, God-honoring disciplines. It just begins to open things up. I remember when I was in college, that it clicked with me, that when I wanted to be, in days ahead, a God-honoring husband, it clicked with me, that that was a great goal. But to be that, what I needed to be first was a person that was wholeheartedly following Jesus Christ, that the intimacy with my father and how he was making me in to a disciple of him would then overflow into becoming that God-honoring husband. It finally clicked with me. When our children were born, uh, I remember when Caleb was born, he's our our oldest, I I remember wanting to be so badly a God-honoring father that would teach our kids to see life from God's point of view. The same principle was true, and and I realized, God, I need to continue to be a wholehearted follower of Jesus Christ that would then overflow into my goal and my desire to be a God-honoring father to my children. I remember when I came to understand that when it comes to life, that everything we view is dependent on how we do see the Word of God. Everything is affected on your view of Scripture. And it was in my study and understanding of God's Word that began to unlock my passions. It began to unlock the passion of wanting to be a godly father, of wanting to be a godly husband, and my passion for the local church. One habitual act of obedience then begins to open up the doors of God-honoring disciplines that allow you to become who you want to be before God in the next five five years. I guarantee you that Daniel, his habit of prayer, it was that that unlocked for him the personal disciplines that led to a life of wisdom, that led to a life of strength, even in, as we see here, the face of adversity. You see, we know the end of the story, don't we? We know that God ended up delivering Daniel from the mouth of the lions. But you know what? I don't think it really mattered. Because he was a follower of God. And nothing was going to change that, even the threat of death. It was his habitual act of obedience that unlocked the character that allowed him to be the man that God had called him to be. As we see that large principle from Daniel, it moves us into then, how do we lean into 
what do we need to start? Based upon who we want to become, what do we then do we need to start? And so for applications, let me just ask you two questions. Number one, based upon who you want to become, then who, or excuse me, what goals do you need to have? What goals do you need to have? Now let me just talk for a moment about goals and just flip this over. I believe that there are two types of goals. One goal would be the means to an end goal. And the other would be what I would just call end goals. Let me just talk about means to an end goals first. When you talk about means to an end goals, it always equals the what. Or excuse me, the what. I'll learn how to spell in a minute. It always equals the what, right? What is it that I'm going to enjoy? What is it that I'm going to get if I reach my goal? Now, we all need to have end goals, or excuse me, means to an end goals, right? So those of us who want to retire someday, if we are wise with our money and we put money away, the means to an end goal says, I should be able to retire someday, right? Those are good goals, and we need to have means to an end goal. Goals. But let me share with you a danger of just having means to an end goals and not end goals as well. Spiritually speaking, if we are constantly saying, what am I going to get, or if we have a goal that then also goes to a so statement, saying that, hey, I want these goals so that I might, right? What that does is it causes us to be preoccupied with the future, doesn't it? And so when we are constantly preoccupied with the future, what happens is we miss the moment that God has given us. We miss the season that God has given us. And when we are constantly preoccupied with the future, we will struggle with biblical contentment. We will struggle with biblical joy. We will struggle with biblical happiness because we're constantly looking at what is next so that I can have something different. And although we do need to have some of those goals, I would tell you that we need to begin with the who goals. And the who goals is always the who, not the what, right? And when you say, who, my goal is to become something that all of my means to an end goal will flow out of, everything changes. And who, who do we, as a faith community, want to be like? Our desire is to be like Christ, right? That's what we want to be like. And then from that, we flow into everything that we want to do and to become. And guys, let me tell you, it wasn't until I understood the difference between these two things and how to operate under the who before I get to the means to an end that I began to understand the passions that God had given me and to begin to learn that who I was always yielded and unlocked who then or what then I wanted to accomplish. I hope that makes sense. Daniel I believe Daniel had the discipline to pursue God daily and it unlocked a worldview that affected everything that he did. Now, based upon who you want to be, what goals do you need to have? And second, based upon who you want to be, what is one small system that will move you in that direction? Notice I said small, one small system that will move you into that direction. Let's talk about systems for a second. You might come to me and say, Jason, uh, I want to begin to see life from God's point of view. And I would look at you and say, that's great. The way that you do that is you begin to get in God's word. And it might be overwhelming. So I would tell you, you know what? One small step for you might, to, might be to go to version. U version has like 400 different small studies from five days, three days, five days, seven days, 21 days, 30 days. 
And in this time of crisis, you've got some more time, and you might want to start a system and say, you know what? I want to develop a habit to be in God's word. I'm going to use this resource, and I'm going to ask God to begin to help me begin to see life from his point of view. Some of you have been doing that, but you want to go deeper. For some of you, the right move would be is to recognize somebody and say, you know what? Would you be willing to be my mentor? I've watched you live your life from God's point of view, and I want to grow deeper in that. I want to become more intimate with my Father. Would you allow me to meet with you, video platform during this time, whatever you choose to say, hey, would you help me see life from God's point of view and share your life with me. Others of you just, you've got time, you need to start reading some books that help you see that way. Uh, I apologize. I have two books sitting at home right next to a chair that I wanted to share with you. I'm going to tell you what they are, and I can tell you, I can send the names and all that kind of stuff to you later. One is Living Above the Level of Mediocrity by Charles Swindoll. It's an older book, but I'm here to tell you it changed my life when I was a bit younger, living above the level of mediocrity. And the second book I'm in right now, it's by John Eldridge, and it's simply called Getting Your Life Back. And it has just the simple idea of seeing every day through God's point of view. So maybe you're wanting to do that, and you need to start a small system to begin to pursue an intimacy with God. You might come and say, you know what? I want to be a God-honoring husband or wife. That's as a husband, Jason, you, that's what you wanted to be. I share that joy or that desire. And if you're a wife, you desire to be that way too. Let me just tell you something. Let's go back to end goals and the who. I would tell you to not worry about how to become a godly wife or a godly husband. That's not where you start. Where you start is getting into the scriptures and saying, what does a biblical man look like? Getting into the scriptures and saying, what does a biblical woman look like? And as you discover that, you begin to submit your life to biblical manhood or biblical womanhood, and then you begin to see scripture come alive when it comes to a God-honoring marriage, right? The end goal is the who, the means to an end then comes out of that. Same would be true if you're wanting to be a godly parent, what does God say about a biblical man, a biblical woman, right? And then begin to see all of the family verses and how God talks about walking along the road and training your kids up. Small, little, habitual acts to become more like God. Some of you, you're saying, you know what? I'm ready to become a deeper man or woman of spiritual conviction. And you're ready to really get into some deep stuff. You might be ready to grab a book during this season, this crisis time, order it online, a book of doctrine and theology. You're ready for a guy like Wayne Grudem, right? a deep theologian that's written a book on doctrine. And you need to go read that because you're ready for your next step toward Jesus. Whatever system that you are developing, you've got to remember God will do something big as you pursue small, habitual acts of obedience and you start with end goals, who I want to become like Christ, that will then yield the you in five years that God wants you to be. And so now, here's the big question of the day. How do you start today? How do you start today? Now, this service has been a little bit shorter. We want to give you more time uh, to spend. If you're a parent, as Pastor Kevin said in the video, we want to make sure you have time to spend some time with your children. Dads, moms, open up your Bibles, watch these videos, and have church with your kids. But I also want to encourage you to do this. Whatever chat you're in, whatever social group you're in, however you're doing that, why don't you ask that question or answer it? Maybe you want to dig a little bit deeper into Daniel and say, hey, hey, I see this as well. And this helps me understand that whole concept of God unlocking much more than just a means to an end, but it's about the person. And maybe you want to tell your group, this is where I want to start. Anybody want to join me? And during this time, this season, 
you guys pursue God together that way. Now this is foundational and very important. You need to remember that you in five years begins with a single act of faithfulness and obedience today. Your success in five years is because you were successful and honored God today, right? Understanding that God's called you to today. Don't be so preoccupied that you miss today. Where do you need to start? Get it? Good. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Daniel. Thank you for how he teaches us a principle that I'm sure he didn't even know he would teach us generations later of how a small, habitual system in pursuing you developed the character in him to withstand anything that came in life and that he began with the who and it yielded everything else in his life. I pray, Lord, that as we think about us in five years, that we would see that, that we would begin with the who and then discover what we need to start. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity to, to be online together. We worship you and we thank you. And everybody, wherever you are across the world, maybe, everybody said amen and amen. Guys, thanks for that time. I pray that it encourages your soul. Now, we're going to go into worship now. And we're also going to go into giving. And I just, I'm going to just talk about the elephant in the room. The truth is, is that, that we're all a little nervous about finances right now and where it's going to go. And I, I certainly uh, share that with you. And, uh, and yet we have a confidence in our Lord and our Savior that he's going to provide and take care of us. Remember that this is not our home. And when we give, it's an act of faith. And the truth is here uh, in our church, uh, we are still uh, needing to make mortgage payments and pay salaries and the church goes on even though the building is closed. And I want to thank you for being faithful in your faith to trust God and to continue to give. If you give automatically, I want to say thank you to you and may God bless you for that. If you normally give while you're in the seats here, I want to ask you uh, to come alongside me and make your gift automatic. Go online. It's there on the website. It's pretty easy. We've explained it to you. If you need help, email us. We'll help you. Ask your online host how to do it. But go ahead and make that automatic and help us as we continue to work at being the church. Remember, the church is not closed. Only the building is. And so let's just ask God to bless us as we give and as we worship. And so wherever you are, just turn your heart to God and let's worship together. God bless you and we'll see you next week.